no mountain bed. And the main thing is that how to differentiate between one, two, and three, and four. So four, I'm sure you're going to get. One, you're going to get. You think I'm going to ask those questions? Okay, just saying. I might. You know, I like free stuff. But you know, make sure you can differentiate between them. And then we talk about what's the other one called again? I think you got that one now. Okay, good. Um, we're doing a direct laryngoscopy. What do I see in the first one? Okay, I'm going to see the epiglottis. Are you using a Miller or a Mac? That part? Mm, that's a good question. It is. That's an excellent question. That's an advanced question. <laughs> so now you get to answer the question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just what I thought. <laughs> All right, if we're using the curved blade, what's that called? <laughs> okay, we're using a curved blade. Where is it going to go when I put it in? <laughs> it has, there's a space there between the base of the tongue and the epiglottis, it has a name. <laughs> See how proud you are? <laughs> she got it. I know, that's what I'm saying. You're the one that had the great answer. <laughs> so, See, it, it, it's a humbling world we live in. So, that's right. So if I'm using the curved blade, the mat blade, and I put it in, it's gonna go in the space between the base of the tongue and the um, epiglottis. That space there, where you're putting it, is called you're not going to miss that, right? right? Now, if I'm using the straight blade, mm -hmm. what, what are we going to do with the epiglottis? <laughs> awesome. Okay. Perfect. So here's the epiglottis, and I don't have a structure here. Well, let's say I've got the base of the tongue here. I'm using the curved blade. I'm going to put it in this space. I'm going to lift up, right? I have the Miller blade. Here's the epiglottis. Here's the Miller blade straight blade. What am I going to do? Lift it up. Two different blades, two different techniques. Good job. All right, so if I'm using a back blade, where is it going to go? And when I lift up, you don't lift up towards the ceiling. You lift up towards like the angle of the ceiling. Does that make sense? So you're, it's at an angle. You don't go. Because a lot of times then you're going to have to pay for the dental damage. That's walking on the teeth usually breaks the cracks in teeth. That's, you not only lose points, you lose money and you lose value in your own self-esteem because you don't want to do that. That being said, sometimes people come to you and you do a scissors to open their mouth. Their teeth are crumbly and they just kind of, I know, who knew? But it's true. Or they're real loose and wiggly and so you can't, if the, you lose a tooth that way, you can't really help it as long as you're being gentle and safe with the patient. But if I see people like that when I assess them, I let them know, you know, there's possible that it's possible that uh, a tooth could come out. And my main concern with that is yeah, aspiration. You know. Somehow people don't breathe real well when they swallow their teeth. <laughs> okay. So the L and M DL look. Um, what am I supposed to see in a grade one? <laughs> okay, so what's this opening called? The glottis. And why do we call the epiglottis that lacking tissue? Why do we call that the epiglottis? Because that's above that opening, right? The glottis just means opening or aperture. Aperture, opening, um, same deal. All right, so we should see the glottis. We should see the vocal cords. What color are they? You know, that's really helpful. Thank you, Lord, for doing that. Because otherwise you'd be like, what is it? I don't know what it is. Just put it in there. Okay. But now you can tell. And then right next to them would be the false cords. And then you have sort of a mm, area that looks like this. At the bottom, you're going to see some pieces of little, little bumps that are from bones that are inside there. We call them the arytenoids, but I think really technically we have the cuneiforms and, yes, the carniculates. Um, technically, they always say, oh, they're the, I see the arytenoids, but uh, yeah, I don't know if I am or not. But the ones on the bottom are the carniculates, and the ones right next to it. So these are the carniculates on the bottom, and they're a little wider, so it's kind of like this. Then the other ones would be the yeah. ones. Yeah. So you're just seeing that. And when I see, like, let's say I'm doing a DL, and all I see are those bones. I, you know what I know is above those? I know the opening, the glottic opening is there. I'm like, you know, I don't have a good view, but I can... I think I can get the tube there because I can see those little bones. Thank you for that. Sometimes I'll use a bougie for that to get it in there. Okay. Um, hmm. 
So basically, the answer, what do I see with it? Um, L and M, grade one U, everything. But you need to know what those everything's are. So what about the four? Grade four. <laughs> you, you might, really, you might just see some fleshy tissue. Uh, you might just see, uh, yeah, maybe the base of the tongue, or maybe just the tongue. Or you might see a little flip of the front, maybe, of an epiglottis, but usually it's considered, we don't even see the epiglottis. That's how you would define it. We don't see the epiglottis. But there may be some mush tissue in there, and you might think that's the epiglottis. You're not sure. Now, where's your challenge? Figuring out what the difference is between two and three, right? So again, just like the malampedi, know those differences. And study them in a way that you can differentiate between them. Then when you have a question, you go, oh, it must be this, it must be that, it must be this. And then you get them. So talk a little bit, know the nerves, know the LMA sizes. Uh, make sure you can do the malampedi. Make sure you can do the malampedi. Right. Has everyone brushed their teeth this morning? Okay, it's just going to be important. I want you to look at your neighbor, have them open their mouth, and tell me what mal and patty you think they have. You can look either way, left or right. I wish I could. Yes. Um, 
How many questions do you have? 50 questions, mostly multiple choice, some fill in the blank, some true false. 50 ish. You'll have about an hour to take it. Most people take it in less than 30 minutes, typically. Yeah, question? When you're uh, writing questions and for other instructors too, I wonder do you guys try to think about what the boards may ask and try to question it? Uh, yes, similarly? we do. I would say in general, yes, we do. Um, I would also say that my own personal philosophy is to build success early and, and confidence. And um, and then I, that's just how I tend to do it. So I would say most people say the first exam is pretty good. This semester, most people do very well in this course. And they're like, man, OK, you still have to study lots. There's still a lot of information. But most people do very well. Then they get to second semester, and they go, what happened to her? She took the turn. <laughs> we used to like this. Now we don't. Um, and so it gets, I would say they get progressively more board like in my courses. Um, and of course, next semester we do a whole, we only talk about peds for like, you know, four or five weeks, six weeks at the most. Same thing with OB. You could do a whole semester, you could do a whole year course on each of those. Um, and that's the moment you have to get the information. So that I would say that it's more compressed, more compact. And the questions are probably more challenging, more board like, because I only had that one shot to get it in. Okay. The confidence, I'm expecting everyone to do well on the first exam. That being said, study too much. Because you can't, it's not like you can dump it and forget it. You've got to know it. And when you go to the clinical sites and you start, even your observations, people may start pimping them. You know what that means, right? They ask you a bunch of questions. And they might give you an opportunity to do some hands on stuff, even though it's considered observation days. But if you can't answer their question, they'll go, watch me. But if you can answer their question, like, take me through the journey of intubation. Tell me visually what you're going to see. Let's do that right now. So you're all going to be able to do it if they give you the opportunity. All right, so we're going to use a curved blade, which is called nine. typical person is a MAC3. Sometimes we use a MAC4 for longer, bigger. But I would say MAC3 is going to be your typical back. If we use a Miller straight blade, uh, it's usually a Miller 2. Those are the typical ones, so you would know that. Um, we're going to use the curved blade. We go in. Tell me what you're going to do first. You're going to scissor the mouth open. Okay. Then you've got your blade. See, I've got it at an angle a little bit, right? Scissor the mouth open. I've got it in a blade because what am I going to sweep out of the way? I'm going to sweep the tongue out of the way. Then I straighten it up. And then I'm going to put it in. What's that space between the base of the tongue and the tongue? And you have to get the molecular. Ooh, that's a great question. Not anymore. <laughs> so I'm going to lift up towards the ceiling. Okay, I'm not lifting up this way the ceiling towards the corner. I'm lifting up, and then, wow. What should I see? Let's say we have a grade one view. What am I going to see? They're going to ask you. You're like, if you go, Bleh. they're going to go move over. They're going to do what we call the hip check, and they're going to then take over the play. What are you going to see? You're, you've got a grade one view. So, and they might just say, that's the original noise. Who told you that? But just say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Don't worry. All right, and where does the, the tube go? Through the vocal cords. What's that opening called? Okay. See, you've already in space. But they're, they're going to ask you to tell you that stuff. Because if you can't verbalize that, why am I going to trust you to just stick this in somebody's mouth and you can't even tell me what the anatomy is? I don't know. I even do that the first time I worked with the people getting ready to graduate. First time I worked with them, first day, I go, okay, uh, I trust their skills, but I haven't worked with them before, right? I know them. I know them very well. I think of you guys. I'm going to get to know you guys, okay? So I'll say, as you do your direct laryngoscopy, please take us, because you'll be, be sometimes the supervising anesthesiologist right there. Yes, they're always there. This is being recorded. They're always there with me. Um, so I can do my job. So I have them um, take me through the journey. I say, please take me through the journey while you do your DL. What that means is, tell me the anatomy. They don't have to tell me they're scissoring the mouth open. I can see that. They don't have to tell me they're moving the tongue. But once I get in there and they do their DL, they lift, I want to know what they're seeing. Because then when they see it, I can see it. And I'm like, sounds like this is what I'm seeing. Sounds like it's going to be fine. Okay. Usually, I will put my fingers right about here. I'm not pressing down. What is that called? OK, we do that with what kind of technique? RSI. RSI, which stands for? Oh, you guys are good. And why do we do that? 
<laughs> to prevent, theoretically, to prevent aspiration because it presses down. The esophagus is right below the cords, and so when you press down there, we're kind of closing that area off. So theoretically, it works. But if there's enough pressure in there, nothing's going to work. I'm just going to say that too. And if by accident you put the cord into the stomach, if you put the tube into the stomach, just leave it in there because it's a good conduit. It's kind of like an NG tube, OG tube, just let it go. But, and then also, you know, when you do your next EL, you know where the tube doesn't go. It doesn't go where the one is you just put in. Okay, so make sure you can, you can do that journey so that people will give you the opportunity to do that. Do that. Do this thing, which you're going to love doing the intubation. Let's see if I can. Awesome. So who needs an advanced airway? Not everybody. And not as many people as we used to think did. Why? Because we have great, better equipment now. The things that used to be, um, I wouldn't say quite life and death, but things that used to be very dangerous are now like, we've got the stuff. And as long as you do a good assessment ahead of time, you'll know what to do. Okay. Now, Remember some of those pictures that Dr. Kushimiri had of the different airways? Mm -hmm. Oh, and the big goyer or tumor or whatever it was. Imagine trying to intubate that person. Or like some of these, the person that tried to commit suicide but were not successful. And this one must be one of my comrades in the Army. Now, that's what happens when people try to commit suicide by putting, you know, a gun or a rifle here or whatever. And they try to, like, basically blow their brains out and it doesn't work. Whoops, missed. So, You've got to be able to get, now he's awake. That cannot be a comfortable moment. You, let's say he's going to have surgery, right? You've got to be able to intubate this person. Or let's say he loses his airway. You've got to intubate this person. Wow. Um, I, it's really, in some ways it might be easier because you just go where the bubbles are, right? If he's breathing, you go where the bubbles are. But you could still put the tube in the esophagus, right? Mm -hmm. Wow. You may have, if you're in a level one trauma center, Tampa U of Health, you might run into this. How are you going to intubate? Now, in the in the military, this may not have been a self-inflicted wound. I can't imagine someone was sniffing out the IEDs. That's usually what the canine unit does. But um, this could have been caused for lots of reasons. You've got to intubate this guy because we're going to surgery. Wow. I'm going to intimate this guy sitting up. Does that make sense to you? Uh, yeah. You lay this guy down. Aspiration for blood. He's going to eat whatever is left in there. Is, he's not really going to be able to have an air, airway. Can't really maintain it very well. But the rule of thumb is to always go where the bubbles are. But realize bubbles. Did you ever burp? Just say. Bubbles come out of the tummy as well too. So you might. If you use the only theory is go where the bubbles are, you might have an issue and get it in the wrong place. But you can still listen. This guy, thank you for having a chest left, because you can still listen to see if you got it in the right place or not. Everybody can intubate into the esophagus. It happens. I can't remember the last time I did. Uh, I probably did a year ago. Um, but you know what? I listen with my stethoscope. I listen here, here. I always go here first, because I want to know if it's in the tummy first, because I don't want to be pushing that bed and go, oh, where is it? Down here, down here. I always start with the tummy first because I'll hear those air bubbles. I'm like, oh, you're wrong, you're wrong. Oh, oh, stop, get it out. But I'm putting the tube in where I think it is. I can't do a direct laryngoscopy because he doesn't have the stuff there. I don't even know if he has an epiglottis, I can't really tell. But I still have to intubate this guy because he's going to surgery. I'm going to expect a challenging airway here. We're going to probably sedate him some and that's another question you and you have to make those decisions about you want to sedate him a little bit to keep him comfortable he probably has already been sedated already probably he's had some narcotic something maybe even some reset but you don't want to sedate him so much that he totally loses his air where he can't breathe so this is one of those moments where somebody especially in trauma when you do um difficult airways or awake airways a person might remember that. And it's pretty traumatic to have a tube put into your trachea if you're awake. However, he can survive it. 
You may have to do some of these. I've never had to do one this this bad. But if you go back and look at Dr. Cushenberry's pictures, there's every variety you could possibly see of things that you're going to have to think about. Okay, what's that? Thank you. Yep, people go, I've never seen it. Thank God, you hope you never do. And somebody else once said, well, let's just do a nasal intubation. Okay, where, do the, where does it go? Yeah. Yeah, it takes that turn, right? It takes that turn. So you're eventually going to run into this. We might have to use um, two of our advanced techniques for this if, I, if we can't intubate, because I can't even hardly imagine how we're going to do this. We might be able to try a GlideScope or CMAC or McGrath. I really don't think we're going to get too far with that. You might just have to do an emergency airway if they lose it. So there's two basic emergency airways. One's the um, interim until you can do the other. So what's the one, the interim we would do? Yeah, we're going to use jet ventilation, but um, what's, what do we call that? Okay, so know that. And the equipment we would use would be? What size syringe? Three cc. Three cc. I would use whatever was there. But we say a three cc syringe. What size angio cap? And again, I would use the biggest one I had available. So if I, if I, I wouldn't wait for someone to dig up and find, you know, 14. If I had a 16 laying right there, right? And whatever I have that's bigger that I can use, I could still save someone's life. But ideally, three cc syringe, 14 angio cap. Um, and then you need the jet ventilation stuff. So you give these bursts of air just to get them long, get them there long enough until someone can do the emergency airway, which is what that, what is that one called? The surgical. <laughs> and um, in the Army, you might be trained to do that. Um, in your normal civilian world, you're, they're not going to do that. We're going to wait for someone to come do that for you. It might be the surgeon. It could be the ER doc. It could be the anesthesiologist, maybe, and maybe where you practice, if it's a CRNA only group, um, they may have trained you to do it. But in most of the places you're doing your clinical sites, someone else will be doing that. Your job is to get as much air in there as you can just to get them through until they can get that church layer. Wow. I don't even want to ever see that. I have not seen that. I've seen some swelling, and I've seen it getting bigger by the second, but I was able to get people intubated before it was too late. Okay, in this we're going to see quite a bit. Yes, question? Uh, with the angioedema, I'm just trying to picture the whole retrograde aspect, like with that. Sometimes you can, if there's enough space, if there's enough space in there, sometimes it's just too tight to even get any, like you could maybe get this stylet, uh, the guide wire in, yeah. but you might not be able to still get the tube in. I would try whatever I could to save this person's life. If they if they weren't able to breathe, they weren't able to exchange. I would do whatever I could. Okay, so you're going to see quite a few morbidly obese patients. You probably are going to see as many of them as anything as far as difficult airways. And not all morbidly obese people have problems with their airway. It's an assumption that I make. And you know what they say about assumptions? I'm not going to say it out loud, but you know what they say. Um, but I would say, generally speaking, someone that has a larger BMI, I'm already thinking in my head what alternate technique I'm going to use because they're probably going to be challenging. They may not be. They may not be at all. Their weight may be, they may have a basically normal neck and everything else down is where the BMI is. So if that's the case, they may have a normal airway. But they may still have um, a recessed chin or an anterior airway, so they may still be challenging. But I typically, in my mind, go, okay, this person, before I see the person and assess them, BMI 62. Okay, let me get the glide scope in the scene. I'm going to ramp, ramp um, the bed so I'm ready as much as I can be. Once I see them, I'll decide if I need a difficult airway card or extra pair of hands or what else I might need. But you're going to see these probably more than anything. When, that per when a person has like the no neck, you know, Big, thick neck, no neck, and you, what's this distance called between here and here? Okay, so if they have like one finger breath, think anterior airway, it's going to be challenged. Now, even the glide scope and the graph, all those handy dandy tools may or may not help us with that. So you may have to have other things ready. Okay, some of the equipment. 
nasal rainy tube. Of course, we do these for nasal intubations. What is the RAE? Is it right angle endotracheal tube? <laughs> it's the name of the names of the people that basically invented it. See if you invent something, you get a name after it. It's awesome. This was a question at the uh, College Bowl one year when I was at AANA. So what does it stand for? R. Ring. That's a quick Google. The A. Adair. So is it LN for the E? Okay, so A is. And what is the R? Ring. Ring. Okay. So now you know a bit of trivia. Do you really need to know that? No, except if someone asks you if they pip you in the OR, they say, what does that stand for? And they go, you know, most a lot of people say right angle and the tracheal tube. They're like, nope, you go, but you'll already know the answer. It really won't matter other than now you know the trivia. So what kind of cases would we use this for? Maxofacial maybe. If someone has a basal or skull fracture, would we use it? No. Um, there are certain techniques we use to put these into, and everybody has their own little way they like to do it. So you will learn as many as you can from different people, but there, we have a set one in here that you can learn, so you at least have something. The light bond. Did anyone, was anyone interested enough to YouTube this and see what it looks like? It's pretty awesome. Basically, you turn the lights out. That's always fun. Turn the lights out. And then it's got this little light right here, and you, you're doing your DL, and you put it in, and you'll see the transluminescence. You ever put a flashlight under your hand? It looks like that. Kind of points cooler. And then what do you do? You advance it. And when the light goes out, what does that mean? The battery died? If the light goes out, you may have gotten in the esophagus. If it stays lit, you might get lucky and get it in the trachea. If when you put it in, if you feel a little, if you feel something like it's boom, 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 ding, 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 so you're probably hitting the tracheal rings and you're in the right spot. Uh, this to me is pretty flashy. I've used it a few times just because it's kind of cool, but in an emergency, I usually stay away from it. First of all, it's not right in my car. So I'm not that good with it because I don't get to use it. There's other things I get to use. I get to use a bougie. I get to use a wide scope. Um, I get to use other things, but it is kind of a cool device. It's kind of fun to work with. Ah, uh, my friend, the bougie. What is this little tip called? Coup day. Where did you ever hear that before? Kind <laughs> of brings back some memories, right? Okay. So it, no, it doesn't normally have this little curve in it, but technique for this would be what? We do the DL, okay, and then we're going to advance it, put it in, and what if I feel that little ding Ah, okay, that's why this is really helpful. Because if you know that the trachea is anterior to the esophagus, if I put it in and it's smooth as glass, it could be in the trachea, because maybe I didn't hit the rings, but it might be in the esophagus. So I like this. Once we get it in there, what do we do? We feed the endotracheal tube, but typically what you do is you take this, you put the endotracheal tube on it already, so you've got the tube would be like here. You advance it, the tube's already on there, you advance it, and then when you get ready to put it in, um, you know that you're in the right place because you felt the tracheal rings. You're also doing the DL, and you may or may not be able to see that. Sometimes it gets, the end of the endotracheal tube gets stuck kind of uh, on those little bones, and so sometimes you have to turn the tube just a little bit to the left, typically. It's a, that's counterclockwise, right? Just turn a little bit to the left, and that will take that. You know how the tube has a little beveled end? You just turn it a little bit to the left, and then it'll get past those points when those help turn right All right, we got the bougie. That's my go-to because uh, I wanted to get good on that because I've been in the Army since I've been a CRNA, and I thought, well, when they send me to combat, which didn't happen, yet um, I can put this in my duffel bag. I can use this with or without batteries. I don't need any technology. I do need a battery in my rigoscope or I'm in trouble. It's really dark in this. But that's why I wanted to be good with this. Every one of our anesthesia cards has them. In most places, they do that too. I can do this with the tube 
and an AMBU bag and keep that patient alive. If I have that, even if it's 21% air, and I don't even have it hooked to an oxygen source, I can ventilate that patient, I can keep them alive until, I don't know, until the cows come home or come in combat, or just until we can make the next decision or we have the next thing happen or whatever. But that's why I chose that. It also has another name, the guy that invented this. Remember, anybody know? Eschman, Eschman style let, it's also called that. So if you're in the clinical setting, they, they say grab the Eschman style let and you go, all I see is a bougie. You might, you know, I'm saving you a moment here. You're not gonna lose any points because you know it has more than one name. So I call it the bougie, or some people say, let's move you down. Not really. It's, the, it's also called Eschman style let. Uh, fiber optic is awesome. If you ever get a chance to play with these in free time, you're going to have lots of free time in this program. <laughs> this little dial here, you move it, you, so you hold it up here, and that little dial, it makes this have that little, it, this makes it go like this, a little angle like this. So when you're, when you're looking at it and you do it, you want that part to go up, to be this way, you don't want it to go. Otherwise, you're, you're digging for the esophagus, really. You don't want to do that. So the neat thing about this is you just look in there and you can see what you're seeing. I like it when these are hooked up to a screen so everybody in the room can see what you're seeing. That's what's really cool. I like that a lot, especially when I'm working with a student <laughs> because then I see what you're seeing and I, I, have, I have something to say to help guide you to be successful in the innovation. But if I don't see it just you're by yourself, I'm like, let me see. Oh, okay. And then it's kind of like it's a one person thing this way. Whereas if it's on a screen, we can all work together and you can work through it to be successful. That'll be on your difficult airway card. They have adult sizes and pediatric sizes for those. And the famous glide scope. Now there's lots of different versions of these. These are the ones that have the plastic uh, mouth, I don't know what you can call it, plastic handles that fit right on the end of this. This is the pediatric one. This is the adult one. And they, these just fit right on there. But they also make a glide scope where you have to take them off and wash them. The thing I don't like about the glide scope is it takes a lot of space up in there. There's like a big square because it has to fit this fiber optic piece in. When the fiber optic piece like on a C-Mac, it's already built into it and it doesn't take up as much space. So if I have somebody with a small mouth or a large tongue, then sometimes the glide scope, even though I have a great view, it's really hard to get the tube in place because it takes up so much space. But I still like the glide scope. It's my go-to. That and the CMAT, whichever one's available. We also have the McGrath, which is cool. Um, and it has just a little bitty screen on the side, so it looks like a regular laryngoscope, close to a regular one. It has a little plastic thing that fits on the end for each patient. And then it's got a little screen right here. So not only can I see it, but when my students are using it, so it's, it's cool. So everybody in the room can see it. And it doesn't take up as much space as the glide scope either. What's this called? It is a stylet specifically. It's called the rigid stylet. Rigid as opposed to the other ones you will see are a lot more flexible. And when you use the GlideScope or CMAC or McGrath, a lot of times people will require you to use these. Put a little bit of lube on a 4x4 gauze thing, and then I usually just run it here so it's lubricated. And I always test it to make sure it goes in and out of the tube easily. But nothing worse than getting it. <laughs> you try to pull it out. You can't, you've got the two men, you know, pull all this stuff and it's really hard to get out. So I always lubricate it just a little bit to make it a little easier. But that's a rigid solid. And there's techniques that go along with how to use that too. Yes, we got the close up view of that. All right, so retrograde intubation. Did anyone look that up on YouTube? It's pretty cool. Okay, so basically, we take this, what is this, like an angio cap? We put it in pull the needle out, so we've just got the plastic catheter here. Then we have the um, guide wire, we put it in, and it's it's flexible. You're hoping that it goes, you know, not, yeah. You're, you're hoping that it goes up into the nasal airway here, and then you have to get the McGill's and grab it, pull it out. So it's kind of like you've got it going from like, like here, here, and you go, uh, 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 uh. I like the sound effects. Then you're gonna gently, oh, what you're gonna do is, um, they don't show it, but here I'm gonna get um, some hemostats. I'm gonna secure it, right? But it'd be it just really, it'd be a bummer to lose it. <laughs> that soon into the adventure. We take, then we're gonna take this off, 
we're going to put the McGills there. Then I'm going to take my tube. I'm going to feed it over that guide wire. And then I usually put a hemostat on that end, too. That's just me. But it, it's flimsy, so it's kind of hard. And then we're going to gently put it in. And you know it's in the right place, right? And when it gets here, what are you going to do? You're going to pull the guide wire out, and it's going to be right in place. Theoretically. Now, that's a pretty advanced technique. And um, I've, not, I've only got to do it uh, simulated and with cadavers or pig tracheas. I've done it. But um, I've not gotten to use it in practice. Fortunately, I've been able to use other things that were readily available and, um, for me, easier than that. But it's a cool technique to know. And if I were to go downrange in the Army, um, that's one of those things I would practice again before I practice. So this one, you can go nasally, it can come out nasally as well. It can go either way. Either, either way. Uh, it can go either way. You can have it come out the mouth, you can have it come out the nose, depending on what you're going to be doing. But I'm just, at this point, I'm just trying to get, um, yeah, I want to get an airway. This, is, this one takes a little time, so there's other things I would do first if it was more of an emergency. It's an advanced airway technique, but I would probably use something else if I was in a hurry to get an airway. Yeah, pretty cool though. If you didn't get a chance to YouTube it, I would just this is kind of cool. Whenever I YouTube those, so I usually go to the one that's like one or two minutes. I usually do the 15 minute explanation ones. Okay. All right. Here's the little what do they call it? Uh, regulator. Transtracheal. So you're doing little bursts of very high flow oxygen, like 50 PSI, and it's just to get enough oxygen in there to keep the person alive till we can do a surgical airway. And um, the problem is you can cause barrel trauma with this because it's really high PSI. And you can also get a lot of air in the tummy. And at this point, you can't ventilate, you can't intubate. I've got to save this person. So this would save somebody's life, and that's what we use it. It's not, our, it's not what we go to. It's not something that we practice because we're working with a student today. It's really life-saving measure. Um, oh, and there's, yep. Just a quick question. With the transtracheal jet, it needs to have 50 PSI. So the, the uh, supply should be directly on the pipeline, like go straight on the wall? Yeah, there will be a connection to that. Yeah. Okay. Not, not the anesthesia option, because that's um, already a, a It's already been pressure. reduced, right. And there'll be each place will have its own. This is how we do it, kind of a thing. Um, so, and that might be a question when when you're in uh, in a case and it's a longer case and everything's on the maintenance and the patient's doing fantastic. That might be a good time to talk to your CRNA about have you ever done this and where's the equipment? Because we usually have it like in our bottom drawer. And they say, well, how would you set it up? If I had to set it up right now, what what, what would I need to do? And they would show you because each place will be a little bit different, um, and they they can teach you that pretty quickly. I've never done this, never want to. Incision this way, then incision this way. The main thing is getting it in the right spot. So remember those pictures that Dr. Kushibira gave you about the anatomy there? Okay, you need to know those. Not just for this procedure, but you should know that. So what is this called, this whole piece right here? Uh, everybody? Are you sure? It's been the same since it's been identified back in the like, 1800s, I don't know. So, okay, so know that. Then, um, what's this one? Know what it is. And then, what's this? What's this? Know what this space is. What do we call, what do we call this in, in layman's terms? Okay. So right below your Adam's apple, you can feel it on yourself right now. Yep. There's a little, you can feel a little soft space in there. What is that? Is that where we go? Yes. Okay. So know the name of it and know that that's what we would do for this as well as this. Now, the chances of you doing that right away, or even ever, pretty pretty slim. But you are the person that would have to do it. Let's say you're at a, you work in 
no offense if you're from Kansas. Let's say you go to Kansas, you're in a rural place. You're in a hospital that has, I don't know, 50 beds, four ORs, and you are it. When the CRNAs come to work, you're it for the day, and then you have a partner, you have like three, and you rotate 12 hour shifts, and then you're on call like every other day. What a life. Okay, but you're out there to get called in. And you're there. You need to know these techniques. It may not happen five, ten years from now, but you're it. And if you have to do something like that to save somebody's life, you will. And it may be that you, um, uh, you're you doing everything you can right then. You tell the nurse to Google on YouTube this technique because maybe you haven't read on it in ten years and you don't know. There's nothing wrong with taking that 30 seconds or 60 seconds or what you need to do it right. You know the basics, so you're going to start, right? And you're going to do the best you can, but you don't want to do the wrong thing either. But if you do nothing, that patient's going to die. You've got to make some decisions. And you've got to make them fast. You go, yeah, I did talk about this in my first anesthesia class on my third semester back in school 10 years ago. But I've never done it, and we've never talked about it since then, so oh, you got to do the best you can. Because it's between you and that person living or dying. Up to you. All right, so know your anatomy. One thing to know, uh, and I don't, didn't mention this, I don't know how much uh, Dr. Cushenberry did, how to measure for an oral airway and a nasal airway. Make sure you know those points and what they would be called um, so you know how to measure for it. And notice that even though to us it looks like this is rounded because your nose goes like this, right? But inside it goes this way. So when you put a nasal trumpet in, you're not putting it up and in, you're putting it straight in. Gently straight. And because it's got a beveled edge too, you may have to do a little turning to get it around the corner. That's cool, you can do that. But know the parts. Okay, so here's the hard palate right here that you see when you do your DL, and here's the soft palate right behind it. Just to, just to clarify, yeah. uh, where did you say that we had to go? Or the jet ventilation and the crack. Who can answer that question? Yeah. And it's it's right below the there's the what's the okay, this is a perfect one. So this is the thyroid cartilage. This is the cricoid cartilage. So it's the ligament here. The cricothyroid ligament. You know, thank goodness things are made logically. They're not shorts. Do you have an announcement or? Uh, thank you for just one moment. Sure. I don't know what to do with the calendar. It's driving me crazy. I just realized last night that my lecture is not on the calendar again. You know, when you look on the NAP calendar, but I am definitely lecturing 1015, mixture solutions, all that stuff. Okay. It was on earlier. Yeah, it was okay. there and then it's gone. I don't know. It's more so. magic. But I just didn't want anybody to think I canceled the class. Oh. All right, thank you. See, you're all blind. Oh. Okay. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Here. Thank you. Yep. Um, another thing just to point out is the hyoid, hyoid bone. bone. That, it's kind of a floating bone. It's put together with a bunch of ligaments. But that's an important one to know where you're going to And here's the, when you put your bougie in and feel that ding, 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 ding. That the trait you're feeling those little bones here, the cartilages and the bones. And that's when you know you're in the right place. Awesome. Oh, yep. Whoop. Sorry, back to the crank. On the YouTube video, this I was and there was just a technique question more so. When they cut, I know non-dominant hand spreads, but they were cutting towards the fingers, the first incision, and then the horizontal. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Because you've got to you've got to break through the skin first. Right. So you want that to be clean. So you break this way. Yep. And then and then when then you spread it and then you're going to go this way. So you, oh. It could go either way. You could go, okay. But, but um, look at a couple of them and see what the majority of people do. In the military, it was the way that you said. For one week. This way. You cut it. Was, oh. Yeah. This way first. This way first. Okay. And then we and then we spread it and then. Typically, but you can look at several and see what folks do. Sometimes a lot of those videos are cool. They're from um, wherever uh, around the world, and you're like, what is how their, their accents may be difficult to understand. But um, a lot of the technique is very much the same. But then some folks have their own special thing they've done. 
So I wouldn't get caught up so much on specific uh, technique. I would look at if, if you're questioning it at all, mm -hmm. then I would just look at several and go with the one, the, the majority. I had a lecture uh, that I listened to point out that you want to go vertical first so that way you don't accidentally cut the jugular or the carotid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. So does that, I don't have a picture with the um, blood vessels there. Yeah. But so basically the blood vessels are the main ones, the big ones are going right. this way, right? Yeah. So I was, I, was, I, was, I was thinking because I've always, you know, you cut away from your finger kind of whenever you do scalpel thing. So that's why I was thinking over this. But YouTube showed it going up first. I mean, of course, the spread is horizontal, but. Whether it's up or down, that is I'm going away from me. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to go away from me. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Have I done that? No. Do I hope I ever do? No. All right. Uh, another reason to not go this way. You've got all these nerves. So again, I would go back to those um, charts from Dr. Kushner that said what does what if you, if you nick this nerve, what, makes, what nerve does it make you worse? We know the gag nerve is, and that's cranial nerve number. Yeah. Okay, you guys are. Make sure you know that anatomy. And here are the axes that I was talking about. We've got the oral axis, the pharyngeal axis, and the laryngeal axis. So this is when you hyperextended the head too much, so the axes don't align. Here you see they're intersected. That's where you're going to get your best view. And here you can see they're not quite intersected yet. So what they did was they lifted the head. And sometimes if it's a smaller person, um, you can actually lift the head to do it. You know, or somebody else can. Sometimes I have to do a DL, I lift the head, and then I'll take my hip, and I'll like hold the head, and then I get the two. You try whatever technique you can. I worked with the CRA at um, U of Health when I was training, and she was uh, well endowed, and she would get, and she was kind of short. She would get down, she would use her chest <laughs> to hold the head. And, she it, and I'm like, I can't do that technique. <laughs> she could get an airway, though, let me tell you. You do what you have to do. And she'd been a CRNA at that point probably 30 plus years. Uh, she could get one. And uh, there was no doubt she was going to get it. And she might have been in some kind of contorted position, but she was going to get that airway to that patient. <laughs> I don't recommend that technique, guys. I'm sorry, I was. <laughs> so here it's showing you with the DL how things align. And notice that it just shows with a little bit of that head. The, little, the head being raised just a little bit, how it brought everything into a line. I think you know the basic anatomy in there now. I'm hoping. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. That doesn't work. All right. So the, the bones, you've got some down here and some over here. Make sure you know those. This piece right here is the? Okay. And let's say we used a MAC blade. And what would the space be between the base of the tongue? Okay. And if I were using a Miller blade to lift this up. This might be the view we see. We just lift up the epiglottis. This is the vocal cords. These right here. Sorry, you guys can't see. Um, then this is the glottis or glottic opening aperture is another word we use. And then you can see the tracheal ring. So when you get that bushy in there, it goes. You can just feel it go. Beep, 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 beep. Cool. That's what I want to see. Frustrating. When you're using a glide scope or a CMAC or even a McGrath, that you have a visual, you have this view, and you're like, okay, now I get to get the tube in there. It looks like anybody in the world can do it. Let's get the beginners in. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it is not easy. It, you get a great view, but sometimes it's still difficult and challenging to get the tube in the right place. So as you do this, you will learn different techniques to get the tube in the right place. Now, this is a good time to use a bougie. If I can't get the tube in immediately, easily, I might use my bougie. So I've got the, the tube, now I've taken the tube and I put it on the bougie and I'm manipulating it and then I see the bougie. Oh, there it is, there it is. And then I can get the tube in there. And a lot of times you can get the turn, little bit to the left, sometimes to the right. I have a quick question. Yep. So you said when you look, you're gonna see your arytenoids. Will sometimes. You, will you see the other two bones, like on a perfect, pristine view, will you see your, like the cuneiform and the other one? Um, Yes, typically. And a lot of times people just refer to those bones down there as a written one. Okay, so then they class fall. Yeah, the yes. A lot of times people just do that. Okay. I guess the word arytenoid is either easier to say or cooler to say than the other two. I'm not sure. But a lot of times people just say that. 
but specifically there are different roles. But in a good view, you'll see you'll see the roles. Okay. You'll see the points where the bones, well, the ends of the bones right. are. You kind of see them right there, right? Yeah. 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 And then up to the right there. Right. Right. It's hard to tell on this one. It's not really focused enough for me to be. I'm not going to commit to that. But I do know this. I have a great glottic opening. I'm going to get the tube in that hole. I know this, and I can see the epiglottis. I can see the cords. So I'm not going to get caught up on whether I see the bones or not. Because at this point, the bones don't matter. I've got a great glottic opening. Who cares? But from your perspective, you need to be able to name those things because we expect you to know. All right, enough. All right, how are we going to get them intubated? All right, nasal intubation. When do we do it? How do we decide if we want to do it? A lot of times uh, when you do your physical exam, you're going to go, oh, I guess we're going to have to do this nasal intubation. Most of the time, you won't have to make that determination just on the physical exam. It'll be based on the surgery that you're doing, typically. So if they get a difficult intubation before orally, you might do it. Um, anytime you've got fractured bones in here, in the face, mandible, yes. Facial deformities, maybe. Um, what are some of the um, conditions that people have or syndromes people have when they have some facial deformities? Cleft palate. Again? Cleft palate. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pierre. And nose. Um, you might go, okay, maybe, maybe not. And, and it just depends on how they present. It depends. Um, it just really depends. And then it, this tells you the how you go about doing it, and different people will tell you different things. So this gives you one technique so you could explain it. Mine, if I'm going to do a nasal intubation, um, I use Afrin spray in both pairs because you don't know which one's best. Usually the right, typically. The majority of the time the right one works just fine. But I have the person breathe. Mine are both plugged up, so I don't know which one's better. But Whichever one gets the best air going through, you're going to plan to use that one first. But you still use afrin spray in each one. What does that do? It helps, it restricts the blood vessels to help prevent nosebleed. Okay? So I'm going to do that first. And they cough usually if they do it right. They squirt it in there because then it goes all the way through and it makes them cough. That's normal. Each near, that's on your physical exam before you even go back. Then I get them in there. I'm going to get them on the monitors. I'm going to have them breathe deep breaths. So we're denitrogening the lungs. And this says use three nasal trumpets, increasing in size, and lubricate them to dilate the nair. Now, a lot of some that's the technique we teach people. But my theory is the more stuff I put in there, the more likely I am to mess up the mucous membranes. That's my theory. But Whoever you're working with and what they suggest, that's what you'll do. That's the right answer to that question. I usually use one nasal trumpet. Um, and it depends on the size of the person's nose and their opening. I, I try to use one just slightly larger than what I see. I loop it up. Then there's a the question, do you use surgical lube or do you use lidocaine based on preference provider? Because um, a lidocaine, when you do it, it's, it takes a little longer for the lidocaine to absorb, so you're not really helping them out too much initially as far as decreasing discomfort. You put it in. This, they're already asleep at this point, right? But you put it in, and then I make sure I can read for them. Yeah, this is working good. I have my tube ready. Most people put it in warm saline, and it just makes it more flexible. I, it depends on the type of tube that I have. We have these uh, blue tubes. I forgot who makes them. Uh, they're a lot more flexible. They're really great. Um, and I don't warm them. But a typical tube, like a melon product, a typical clear tube that you use, a lot of times people will um, warm them first. And it's great because it just makes it a little more pliable. Um, but the only other thing you really need when you do your DL, and I always use a glide scope for these, so everybody in the room can see that I got it in the right place, and I was very gentle when I did it. Theoretically, that's the way we do it. You need McGill forceps for these. What those look like. So they, they kind of have an angle. Um, 
and sometimes people, when they're starting, will grab them and you'll have them going up. You don't want them going up, you want them facing down. Point to remember, it's a little embarrassing. You do it the wrong way. And so you do your DL, you've already dilated this, you've already, they're ready to be intubated. Uh, you pull the nasal trumpet out, you put the tube in, and you remember it goes straight back, right? And if you have, like for me, the blue flexible tube where you've warmed your tube, it, you can gently get it around the corner. And we're looking in the DL and you see, oh, there it is. And you take your McGill's gently and you grab it. Please do not grab the cuff. Why? Oh, you can break the cuff and then all is not. You go to put the, you got, let's say you get it intubated, you get the intubation done. Oh, awesome. Hook it up. You go to, you go to ventilate and you go, what? You've interrogated. The cuff is broken now because you, that's, Another key point when you're learning. Why do I know this so well? <laughs> I, won't, I won't admit to it, but I just this is say I know. So make sure you don't put that. And sometimes it's hard. You think it's, it sounds easy and it's all going to go smooth, but there's sometimes there's not much space and then you've got all this stuff and you're trying to. It's not as easy as it looks. But you grab the tube, don't grab the cuff. And you gently, what I do is I'm doing the DL and I've got the tube. Somebody else, I. You know, I've got the tube. Somebody else, I'm going to ask them to push it to advance it forward. So I always get an extra person in there with me. If I've got the McGill's and I've got it lined up the best I can, I have someone else push the tube for me. Gently, just push it slowly. Then I can kind of manipulate as I need to to get it right to that. They're really cool when they go well. I'm going to stop there. Mm -hmm. And you will find everybody, once you've been doing it for a while, everyone has their own. Awake fiber optics, everyone again has their own way of doing this. We use the same basic, why are we going to do this? I have not done an awake fiber optic in, I can't even tell you, it's been years since I've done one. When, whenever we get to do one at St. Bees, it's like we call everybody, it's not in the room, hey, we're going to go do one. Is there going to do one? <laughs> because we haven't done one in so long, it's like, oh yeah, how do you do it? How do you do it? And then we talk about it. But um, I just haven't had the opportunity, and I'm grateful for that. Um, every place, no, every, every person will end up with their own way of doing it. This is one way to do it, so I would just learn this one so you know a way. What's important here, person's awake. I always like to treat with per se, so they may not remember the trauma of the whole thing. Because even if it's not traumatic technically, like you've not caused any technical damage, it's traumatic, just like when you put an NG tube in an awake patient. I mean, it's, it's more trauma for you. No, it's not really. It's more trauma for the patient. But you know how uncomfortable it makes you feel? You know it's not comfortable. You're trying to talk them through it like it's no big deal. But you know it's a big deal. So if, if you can just give them a little percent, I think that helps. Realize, though, it's not always indicated. You might have someone that really can't do it. So I would know this is a technique, but know that um, everybody has their own. And if you didn't get a chance to YouTube one, do it. So at least you have an eye, a visual in your head how it goes. Um, I think the last one I did was on a person in a halo at U of Health when I was a student. Well, that's not the last one I've done. Is it? I don't think so. But that's one of the one that sticks out in my mind. I'm like, whoa. Like everything's fixed except the stuff I need to get to in a it was, it was really quite a challenge. You should know this difficult airway algorithm, but bottom line is this. We have lots of great equipment and technologies to help us get the tube in the right place the first time. Not everyone will be easy, but when you get to, I can't ventilate, and I can't intubate. That's when we go to those last two techniques, all right? Every, we're gonna try other things in the meantime. And if we anticipate a difficult airway, you can plan, and if you have a plan, it usually goes very well. But even still, sometimes it's very challenging. But if what you're doing is not working, then either give up the airway to let someone else do it if you have that availability, or try a different technique. Don't keep trying and 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 trying some more to do the same thing. 
that's not working. Try something else. And then if that, try, keep trying things until something works. Because if, if you can't innovate and you can't ventilate, I know the final result. That patient is going to die. That's what's at the bottom here. Not death, but you can't intubate. You can't ventilate. That's when we go to the other emergency techniques. That I have, again, not ever done except simulation. Pig tracheas are great for that. Put them in the bushes. You can get them. But I would know this. If you see this, then you do this. If you see that, then you do that. Kind of have that in your head, how you're going to go through the system. I don't like the word fail, but it's on there. Okay. It's only when we talk about the transtracheal, it's temporary. It's only temporary. It's just to keep that patient alive and know the ratio. What does I stand for? And E. And the ratio is one to four. And you can cause that veritrauma. But you might be able to keep them alive. I don't know if I can get this to play in here or not. It's okay. You can watch them. Did you get to see them? Yeah, I, I did when I was going through the lecture tools. I don't ever want to have to do the cryptothyrotomy, but we know why and we know where. Because somehow it makes me feel like I'm doing something compared to nothing. So some of the literature says, yeah, it's really, it's pretty good. Uh, most of it says it's not that great, but it, in my mind, it's all we've got. So I'm going to try something. And in some cases, it will work. And so I'd rather say that I try, and maybe it'll work, and maybe it won't. But the evidence is kind of not that great on it, saying that it works for us. But I still one of those people who do it. So I work with some, some of the... Uh, New um, anesthesiologists, they just gotten out of residence. They go, well, you know, we're sitting there. I go, I'm going to do an RSA. They go, why are you doing an RSA? They go, well, it makes me feel better. Okay, go ahead. You know, because the evidence, I, I know. But it might make a difference. In my little mind, it might make a difference. And if I knew I could do some little thing and I didn't, I, I would feel bad. Now, I don't know if it's going to work or not. If I have a bad situation outcome, I don't know. If I probably didn't cause the problem, but maybe I prevented it, so I'm going to try. So why do we do this? We want to prevent aspiration. When we think there's a high risk of aspiration, there's always a risk of aspiration. When we think there's a high risk of aspiration, um, trauma, we don't know when the last time the person ate, someone that has reflux disease is not controlled, um, pregnant people, I shouldn't say pregnant people, pregnant women. I guess it depends on how you identify, I don't know. It's a new world out there. I'm trying to understand um, how to talk appropriately about those things. But if you expect aspiration, then that's why we do it. Here's a way to do it. A technique. We give Zantac. We give Reglan. We give Bicitra. Decadron, Zofran. We have all the special equipment that we need. Make sure they're in a good position. And you're in a good position. So when I say the patient, they're in a good sniffing position, right? Good sniffing position. But then if you can control the bed, you want the bed to be in a good position so you can get a good look. Because you don't want to have to go like, it makes it harder for you. You don't want to have to be like, you put the bed where you can get a good view. So the bed's in a good position for you. The patient's in a good position. Um, cricoid pressure, yes. We don't ventilate. Now, in your normal sequence of things, you're going to ventilate the test. Or usually before you push the mushroom away. In this case, we don't ventilate. We don't ventilate. You just push the propofol, push the sucks, or rock. Or usually don't use rock because it's a little longer acting, and we don't want to burn a bridge. So typically with these, we use sucks and we'll Once you see they're fasciculating, those are like little muscle twitches. Once you see those, then you intubate. I do these not real often, but often enough that. Um, I have my own little way that I like to do it. And they also do something called a modified RSI. That's where they do ventilate. Now, anyone that's high risk, I don't do it. 
then why am I doing an RSI? <laughs> but sometimes those are modified zero. Well, go ahead and just ventilate and see if you can. Okay. That's modified. Generally, though, an RSI, we do not ventilate. When someone's waking up, if they were a difficult intubation, you do not do those things we call the defects today. You wait until they're awake. If they start grabbing for the tube, it's okay to pull it out. If they've got a head lift, they're breathing well, they've got good tidal volume, good respiratory rate. They need all the criteria for extubation. They've already suctioned real well. You can extubate them. But if they were difficult or challenging to put the tube in, do not do it when they're still asleep. The deep extubation is not a good idea. They can't protect their airway. Don't take the tube out. Ah, uh, laryngospasm. So I think we talked about this earlier too um, in other classes. You want, if there's a laryngospasm going on, we put it on 100% O2. You probably already are because they're waking up. Anyway, we do a jaw thrust. Do that right now on yourself. <laughs> You're jutting the jaw forward, jutting the jaw forward. It's a little tender in there, right? Yeah. Sometimes that helps with the wake up. But that can sometimes break a laryngospasm. You can close the APL valve. What does that stand for? A? Adjustable pressure. Good. And what do we put it on about? 30. 20. 20. 20. I usually do 20. 20 or 30, 20. And some people will say definitely. Don't put it on more than 20. But we turn it up. I usually do 20. And then we just hold the bag. So if you're giving positive, continuous positive pressure, the bag's tight, you give them positive pressure, sometimes that'll break your laryngeal spasm. If that doesn't work, sometimes we give them a little more propofol or, and then they kind of relax. We're trying to wake the patient up though. But if they have a laryngeal spasm, we, sometimes we get them deeper and that will help break it. Or we might get a little fentanyl, we might get a little lidocaine, like a bolus of 50 to 100 milligrams of lidocaine. Sometimes we'll get suction choline, and if we do, this is the dose, 10 to 20 milligrams. We'll break the spasm. Sometimes none of those things do. Usually, I can't even think of the time that it didn't for me, but I start with the simplest, usually the easiest for me. I just do uh, the positive pressure slide first douche. And usually you just hold it, and you have to be a little bit patient to hold it. Like, you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And it seems like a million hours go by. And then it breaks. And if it doesn't, I'll try the jaw thrust, or I'll get somebody with me because I'm holding the positive pressure. I'll do the jaw thrust, or I'll have them hold positive pressure. It depends on if it's an incision first or not. I go down the list, but the last thing I do is the sucks. But usually the positive pressure or the jaw thrust, typically that will do it. What? Help me now. All right. Pretty fast. And furious. Um, take the stuff from last lecture, the basics. You will you you don't want to ever forget that, and you will until you get it memorized. But that's stuff you have to know. These things are things you need to have in your little bag of tricks, and you will get the opportunity to work with the equipment as you do the clinicals, and you just you have to practice with it. What I will do when I'm working with a student, uh, usually I get them again in their last year, and so I'll say, well, have you worked with the bougie? I've never used a bougie. I go, you haven't. Well, and then that day we'll just, most, if, if they're, uh, doesn't matter if they're easy areas or not, I'll say, well, we're going to use the bougie all day. And they get the technique down. Or um, I've never used the graph, so we'll use that all day to intubate. Um, so you'll get to where, once you get some basic skills, intubation skills, then when you go to clinicals, you can, if you get with a CRN that's willing to work with you, and you're at a place that's willing to provide the equipment because that stuff costs money. And so sometimes they won't want to use it unless it's specifically indicated. And you have to honor that too because they don't want to waste equipment and spend extra money um, when it's not needed. But you can work with your CRN and say, hey, can I do mask cases today? And most of you aren't going to enjoy that much. I'll tell you why. <laughs> because it hurts your hands after a while. You've got to hold the mask in place. There's things called mask, mask straps that will help you a lot. But you've got to have so many mask cases in order to graduate. So that would be something I would do as early as you can. Work some into your daily practice, and um, especially on things like you're doing cysto cases, um, eye cases sometimes work. Uh, simple kinds of cases. 
You only have to actually mask them for like 30 minutes for it to count. So you could start with a mask and then slip an LMA in. I know it's strict. So, <laughs> but if you try to mask a case that's like two hours long, I'm telling you. <laughs> Especially if you've got them relaxed, right? But one of the skills of finesse that you're going to need to learn is how to mask the patient. And these masks, we do have different sizes, but there's a typical adult size that comes on every machine. You have people with small faces and people with big faces. And learning to get it in the right spot in terms of on their nose and around their mouth and getting a good seal, if they have a beard or they have indentations or there's something on their face that makes it where you can't get a good seal, it becomes very challenging. So learning the finesse of that, um, it takes time. It's not easy and it takes time. I'm not going to have you do that as an assignment at Thanksgiving with your family, but um, that's one of the first skills. You think intubation is one of the first skills, but really one of the first skills you're going to need to learn is just how to bag someone, have good mass skills for your bag. Okay. If air is coming out, sometimes it's the person's anatomy. Their nose is like this, if you're touching the end of the mask, so air is coming out the side. So sometimes you have to push up on the and I can't do it because I only have two hands, so I'll ask the person I'm working with to do it. They help me out. But you have to tell them to do it. Right? Questions about this lecture? Okay. Yes? You mentioned um, like you were to rupture the cuff with the McGill's. It made me think of um, cuffless tubular situations on adults where we would use a cuffless tube. There may be, but I have not. It's possible, but I can't think of one. So mostly just Peas, right. It's because of their anatomy is different. So for the adults, um, your trach is pretty round and it stays round to by how do you say that? Where it breaks off into two. You've got your left side of the lungs and right side. And um, if you're gonna main stem somebody when you put the tube in, it's usually gonna go to which side? Right. Why? <laughs> the angle there is like 25, like 25 degrees, where on the left it's like 45 degrees. So it's easier to make a short little, a little curve turn, and it's easy to get it too deep. So that's why you listen to lung sounds, because you want to make sure you didn't go just in the right. So you hear, you, if you bag the person after the tubes, and you don't hear any sounds on the left, you have to pull the tube back a little bit. Um, but so that's something probably that is good to mention. Anything else? Oops. Um, a little bit about the exam, just so everybody's as clear as mud. We're gonna, I'm going to see you again later today, but um, since we have some time, uh, it's 50, 60 questions, mostly multiple choice, some true, false, some fill in the blank. I'm not there to trick you, but you may trick your own self. You might trick your own self, and that's that's <laughs> happens. Um, once we finish the exam, we'll have people just leave leave your computers in here if you would take your phones, but leave your computers in here. You'll go out. When the last person's done, I give you about like that person like 10 minutes to have a break, and then we'll come back in and we'll talk a little bit about the exam. I don't go over the exam question by question. Uh, we stopped doing that years ago. There may be some people that still do it. In general, as a part of we decided not to do that. We had some suspicions of people actually cheating, but we are not. Um, and the people we knew were cheating there did not become serenades or sad to say. But, um, so just to avoid any temptation related to that, I will go over the exam with you. If you want to make an appointment with me in the office, we go question by question over your exam. Usually there's three or four people that want to do that, but most people like just, I know, oh, I know why I missed it. You just know that you did. I'll go over the exam in terms of, I'll look at the results and stuff, and anyone, any one question where the majority of people miss, I'm going to talk about it and say, here's what are you, what are you thinking? And we'll talk about it, make sure it's clear. Um, you can always send me an email and go, I was wondering about this. Um, I might just give you a reference to go read, um, or I might just explain it to everybody. Um, but I don't go over the exam question by question, so I don't want you to have that expectation. But individually, if you want to meet with me, we'll make time in my office and we'll, I'll make sure your questions are answered. Okay. But for test integrity, we, we, I stopped doing that, most of us stopped doing that in the program. So. I want you to be successful, and I want you to know what you missed, um, but I'm not going to go over it. We used to go, like, put it up on the board and go over the question, all that stuff, but we stopped doing that. It was the wrong grown-up thing to do. Any other questions? What day are we meeting for our anesthesia gas machine check? 
And the times, even though the you know, you can answer it, so we're going to do it from 9 to 12. So you're going to be in three groups of? Okay, you're going to park in the garage called the little garage, the first one on the right. It's supposed to be free on weekends, they tell me that's true. Yes. That's the plan, yes. Yes. Um, Yep, next week, I'm glad you mentioned that, thank you. Well, I'm going to see you again at the end of today, but um, next week I want you to wear um, scrubs and a lab coat, your UNFID, kind of like you're going to clinicals, because I want to make sure you, I've seen you that way, that when you do your observations, that's how you're going to be. Plus, bring your stethoscopes, we'll do a little compensating um, other things. So, um, and plenty of the malignant hyperthermia, and I'll probably spend a little bit of time talking about some of the clinical stuff too. I should have more ideas about um, when and where and how you're going to be doing your observations. I should know by hoping by today, um, but we might spend a little time talking about that, about care plans and the expectations and that kind of stuff, so everyone feels comfortable uh, in that world. I miss you guys. <laughs> and. And I'm hoping that most of you and your families, wherever they may be, are mostly okay from stuff going on. Now my heart's going out to the Puerto Rican folks. It's just um, unbelievable. Uh, I've read the last book of the Bible. I'm starting to think maybe that's... <laughs> oh my God. What I do think is that um, the world has gone through all kinds of changes through the thousands of years that it's been around, right? And there, before we didn't have uh, the same kind of technology to know about everything and see everything that was going on. So now, when something happens, we know and we know immediately, right? And because there's more people on the planet too, um, all these things impact everything that makes it a lot more uh, dramatic and more hazardous for people and traumatic. It's just uh, all you can do is be safe and do the best you can. So I know that some of you are probably still going through hard times and stuff. If you ever need anything extra from me as far as uh, extra time for something or you need somebody to talk to, feel free to let me know. We'll get together and I'll do what I can to get you to set up in the right place and help you out because it's not easy for anybody to get through all this stuff. And then, and then we got anesthesia school, right? When I was in anesthesia school my first semester in 2004, we had, that was the year we had two hurricanes come through. And I was in Miami. And um, I lived here, and so they evacuated from the campus. I was on South Campus at FIU. Do you got to leave the campus? I'm like, I've got a test. <laughs> I've got a presentation. I don't know. And uh, yeah, we had to evacuate. And the normal four and a half, five hour drive, the way I drive, five hours to get home took about 13 or 14 hours. You know how the traffic is. And then I got home, and they said, Well, you got to evacuate from Atlantic Beach. I'm like, what? Where am I going to study next day? So I can only empathize with you and the stress that it, the extra stress it puts on your world to uh, be where you are in this program and have to go through these things. But no, everybody's going through something. Um, help each other out when you can. You're going to be your your best helpers through this. You're going to have people you bond closer to than others, that's fine. But um, help each other out. And if you know that you're really good at a particular something and somebody else isn't as good as understanding those concepts, help them out. Just bring them into the fold. Help them. Help guide them. Instead of going, eh, there's those people. I'm not going to hang out with them. Go, no. They might be taking care of me or my family one day. I want to help them get it. Because I want them to be as good as I think I am. We've all got a lot to learn. Me too. Every day I go to work, there's stuff I learn. And every patient I take, I'm only as good as the last patient I took care of. I never ever forget that their lives are in my hands. And at any moment, I can save their life or I could kill that person by doing the right thing or not doing the right thing. I never forget that. You guys need each other to help help each other through the times. It's, it just gets more fun as you go along. Okay. Uh, your next class starts at 10, sorry, or 10.30? 10. Okay. So you have a little bit of time. You can get a coffee, walk around, eat a snack. And I will see you at 10.15. Yeah. So 10. Yeah. 10.15 or a little before, you know, like in the Army. If you're